Hey guys, we're getting ready to do chapter six of leadership and self-deception. Getting out of the box. We appreciate you watching. And this time a friend of mine is gonna do the reading for the two male uh two male parts, and I'm gonna do the female. Go figure. Chapter six, the deep choice that determines influence. So what's the something deeper? I asked curiously. Well, what I've already introduced you to, self-deception, Bud replied whether I'm in or out of the box. Okay, I said slowly, wanting to know more. As we've been talking about, no matter what we're doing on the outside, people respond primarily to how we're feeling about them on the inside. And how we're feeling about them depends on whether we're in or out of the box concerning them. Let me illustrate the point further with a couple of examples. About a year ago, I flew from Dallas to Phoenix on a flight that had open seating. While boarding, I overheard the boarding agent say that the plane was not sold out, but that there would be very few unused seats. I felt lucky and relieved to find a window seat open with a vacant seat beside it, about a third of the way back on the plane. Passengers still in need of seats continued streaming down the aisle, their eyes scanning and evaluating the de desirability of their dwindling seating options. I set my briefcase on the vacant middle seat, took out the day's paper, and... Now, we won't be meeting Kate in this, I thought. So I'll do Tom and you do Bud, okay? Right now, mm -hmm. you're Bud. <clears throat> and started to read. And I remember peering over the top corner of the paper at the people who were coming down the aisle. At the sight of body language that said my briefcase my briefcase seat was being considered, I spread the paper wider, making the seat look as undesirable as possible. Do you get the picture? Yeah. Good. Now let me ask you a question. On the surface, what behaviors was I engaged in on the plane? What were some of the things I was doing? Well, you were kind of being a jerk, for one thing, I answered. Now that's certainly true, he said, breaking into a broad smile. It's not quite what I mean. Not yet, anyway. I mean, what specific actions was I taking on the plane? What was my outward behavior? I pictured the situation. You were taking two seats. Is that kind of the thing you mean? Sure. What else? Uh, you were reading the paper? You were watching for people who might want to sit in the seat next to you? To be very basic, you were sitting. Okay, good enough, said Bud. Here's another question. While I was doing those behaviors, how was I seeing the people who were looking for seats? What were they to me? Hmm. I'd say that you saw them as threats, maybe nuances or problems, something like that. I nodded. Hmm. What would you say I considered the needs of those still looking for seats to be as... Would you say that I considered the needs of, needs of those still looking for seats to be as legitimate as my own? Not at all. Your needs counted and everyone else's was secondary. If that. You're kind of seeing yourself as the kingpin. Bud laughed, obviously enjoying the comment. Well said, well said. And I continued more seriously. You're right, on the plane. If others counted at all, their needs and desires counted far less than mine. Now compare that experience with this one. About six months ago, Nancy and I took a trip to Florida. Somehow, there was a mistake in the ticketing process and we weren't seated together. The flight was mostly full, and the flight attendant was having a difficult time trying to find a way to seat us together. As we stood in the aisle trying to figure out a solution, a woman holding a hastily folded newspaper came up behind us from the rear of the plane and said, Excuse me, if you need two seats together, I believe the seat next to me is vacant. I'd be happy to sit in one of your seats. Now, think of this woman. How would you say she saw us? Did she see us as threats, nuances, or problems? No. It seemed like she just saw you as people in need of seats who would like to sit together. 
that's probably more basic than what you was looking for. But on the contrary, that's a terrific way to put it. She saw us as people. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Now let's compare the way this woman apparently saw others with the way I saw those who were loading onto the plane and my story involving the briefcase. You said that I saw myself as kind of a kingpin, more important than others, with needs that were greater. Hmm. Is that the way this woman seemed to see herself and others? Oh, you said that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Is that the way this woman seemed to see herself and others? Did she, like me, seem to privilege her own needs and desires over the needs and desires of others? Doesn't seem like it, no. It's sort of like from her point of view under the circumstances. Your needs and her needs counted about the same. That's how it felt. We, here we have two situations in which a person was seated on a plane next to an empty seat, evidently reading the news, reading the paper and observing others who were still in need of seats on the plane. That's what was happening on the su surface, behaviorally. But notice how this, how different this similar experience was for me and for this woman. I minimized others. She didn't. I felt anxious, uptight, irritated, threatened, and angry. While she appeared to have no such negative emotions, I sat there blaming others who might be interested in my briefcase seat. Maybe one looked too happy, another too grim, another had too many carry-ons, another looked too talkative, and so on. She, on the other hand, Seemed not to have blamed, but to have understood whether happy, grim, loaded with carry-ons, talkative or not, they needed to sit somewhere. And if so, why shouldn't that seat next to hers, and in her case, even her own seat, be as rightfully theirs as any others? Now here's a question for you. Isn't it in the case that the people getting on both planes were people with comparable hopes, needs, cares, and fears, and all of them had more or less the same need to sit? That seemed about right. Yes, I agree with that. If that's true, then I had a big problem, because I wasn't seeing the people on the plane like that at all. My view was that I somehow was entitled or superior to those who were still looking for seats. Which is to say, I wasn't really seeing them as people at all. They were more like objects to me in that moment, more than people. Yeah, I, I can see that. Notice how my view of both myself and others was distorted from what we agreed was the reality. Although the truth was that all of us were people with more or less the same need to sit, and I wasn't seeing the, situ I wasn't seeing the situation that way. So my view of the world was systematically incorrect, was a systematically incorrect way of seeing others and myself. Saw others as less than they were as objects with needs and desires somehow secondary and less legitimate than mine. But I couldn't see the problem with what I was doing. I was self-deceived or in the box. The lady who offered us her seat, on the other hand, saw others in the situation clearly without bias. She saw others as they were, and people, like herself, with similar needs and desires. She saw, straightforwardly, she was out of the box. So the inner experiences of two people, although they exhibited the same outward behaviors, were entirely different. And this difference is very important. I want to emphasize it with a diagram. It's like this, Tom. Stepping to the side of the board so that I could see. Whatever I might be doing on the surface, whether it be, for example, sitting, observing others, reading the paper, whatever. I'm being one of those two fundamental ways whether I'm doing it. Either I'm seeing others straightforwardly as they are as people like me who have needs and desires as legitimate as my own, or I'm not. As I heard Kate put it once, one way I experience myself as a person among people, the other way I experience myself 
as the person among objects. One way I'm out of the box, the other way I'm in the box. Does that make sense? I was thinking about a situation that has occurred a week earlier. Someone in my department has made herself into a terrible nuisance. And I couldn't see how this in-the-box, out-of-the-box distinction applied. In fact, if anything, the situation seemed to undercut what Bud was talking about. I'm not sure I said, let, let, let me give you a situation and you tell me how it fits. Fair enough. I'm going to take a seat. I had a conference room around the corner from my office where I often go to think and strategize. The people in my department know that the room is like a second office to me and they're careful now after a few altercations over the last month not to schedule it without my knowing. Last week, however, someone in the department went in and used it. Not only did she use the room without scheduling, but she erased all my notes from the whiteboard. What do you think about that? Under the circumstances, I'd say there was pretty more poor judgment on her part. I was peeved, to say the least. It took me a while to reconstruct what I had done, and I'm still not sure if I have everything right. I was about to tell more about how I immediately had her called into my office, refused a handshake, and then told her without even asking her to sit down. And she was never to do that again, or she would be looking for a new job. But then I thought, hmm, better of that. Instead, I said, Bud, how does self-deception fit into that scenario? Let me ask you a few questions. And then maybe you can tell me. What kinds of thoughts and feelings did you have about this woman when you found out what she'd done? I guess she wasn't very careful. Okay, go on. I suppose I thought it was stupid of her to do what she did without asking anybody. Mm, it was pretty presumptuous of her, don't you think? Certainly not wise. Anything more? No, that's, that's all I remember. Let me ask you this then. Do you know what she wanted to use that room for? Nope. But what does that matter? Doesn't change the fact she shouldn't have been using it, does it? Perhaps not. But let me ask you another question. Do you know her name? The question caught me by surprise. I thought for a moment. I wasn't sure I'd ever heard her name. Had my secretary mixed in it? Or did she say it herself when she extended her hand to greet me? I searched my memory, but there was nothing. But why should that matter anyway, I thought to myself, emboldened. So I don't know her name. <laughs> so what? Does that make me wrong or something? No, I guess I, guess I don't, bud. I, I, I can't remember. Now here's the question I'd really like you can to consider. Assuming that this woman is, in fact, careless, stupid, and presumptuous, do you suppose that she's as careless, stupid, and presumptuous as you've accused her of being when all this happened? Mm, I didn't really accuse her. Not in your words, perhaps. But have you had any action with her, interaction with her since the incident? I thought of this ice-cold reception I gave her and the offer of her hand rebuffed. Yeah, just once. Tom, I, I want you to imagine that you were her when you met. What do you think she felt from you? The answer, of course, was obvious. She couldn't have felt worse if I had hit her with two by four. I remember the tremor in her voice and her uncertain yet hurried steps as she left my office. I wonder now for the first time how I must have hurt her and what she must have been feeling. I imagine that she must now be quite insecure and worried, especially since everyone in the department seemed to know what had happened. Yeah, bud, I said slowly looking back on it. I'm afraid I didn't handle the situation very well. Then let me come back to my prior question. Do you suppose that your view of this woman at the time made her seem worse than she really was? Hmm. Well, but that hasn't changed the fact that she did something she shouldn't have 
does it? Not at all. And we'll get to that. But I want you to consider this. Whatever she was doing, be it right or wrong, was your view of her more like my view of the people on the plane or more, more like the view of the woman I told you about? Mm. Think of it this way. Were you regarding her as a person like yourself with similar hopes and needs, or was she just an object to you? As you said, just a threat, a nuance, or a problem? I guess she might have been just an object to me. And so now, how would you say the self-deception stuff applies? Would you say you were in, a, in the box or out of the box? I guess I was in it. That's probably worth thinking about, Tom. Because, the, because this distinction reveals what's beneath Lou's success. And Zagram's, for that matter. Because Lou was usually out of the box. He saw straightforwardly. He saw people as they were as people. He found a way to build a company of people who see that way much more than people in most organizations do. If you want to know the secret to Zagram's success is that we've developed a culture where people are simply invited to see others as people. And being seen and treated straightforwardly, people respond accordingly. And that's what I felt and returned to Lou. Well, uh, that sounded great, but it seemed too simplistic to be the element that set Zegram apart. It can't really be that simple, can it, bud? I mean, if Zagram's secret were that basic, everyone have would have duplicated it by now. Don't misunderstand. I'm not minimizing the importance of, for, for example, getting smart and skilled people into the company or working hard or any other number of things that are important to Zagram's success. But notice, everyone else has duplicated all of this stuff, but they've yet to duplicate our results. And that's because they don't know how much smarter smart people are and how much more skilled skilled people are, skilled people get, and how much more harder hardworking people work when they see and are seen straightforwardly as people. And don't forget, self-deception is a particularly different, difficult sort of problem to the extent that organizations are beset by self-deception and most of them are, they can't see the problem. Most organizations are stuck in the box. By the way, that woman's name is Joyce Mullman. Who? What woman? And the person whose hand you refused. Her name is Joyce Mullman. Hey guys, thanks for watching or listening to chapter six of Leadership and Self-Deception, Getting Out of the Box. Chapter 6 is was named The Deep Choice That Determines Influence. Thanks for watching.